attendees are in listen only mode. All right, guys, welcome. Welcome tonight for tonight's interview with seller finance experts number four, live from Mississippi, welcoming Walter Wooford to speak with us and talk to us about profitable seller financing. And as you guys know, these are pretty much no holds barred, cut right to the chase, no fluff, no filler. Uh, sometimes we occasionally might have an offer for you guys, but these are these are 100% content-oriented calls. Before we get started and, and introduce Walter, can you guys tell us that you can hear us? Give us a sound check, an audio check. You can see the screen. Well, this is Walter. I'm here. Glad to be here, Mark and Tara. All good. Sounds good. Thanks, can Mark. hear you. Five, five. Walter, I got you. All right. Well, welcome, Walter. Welcome. Uh, it's uh, Egg Bowl week out there. So I know no one. I know no one likes uh, college football in uh, Mississippi. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a big deal here this week. Huge deal. <laughs> yeah, they're both uh, good for the first time in the same year, as as far as I can remember. Who who you, who you got? Well, you know, I don't care for either one of them because I didn't go there. <laughs> but, all my, but all my three of my kids went to Ole Miss, so I guess I better root for them. But we've got a daughter-in-law who married my son. She, he went to Ole Miss, so we got mar we got family conflict. Let's just say that. Gotcha. A house divided. Well, guys, Walter is an expert on seller financing. Uh, his he's known as Wally Pop. We can also call him the uh, granddaddy of uh, seller financing. He's been doing this longer than, than a lot of us have been uh, in the business and really spin circles around the competition. He also is involved in IRA investing and basically uh, teaches classes year-round in, uh, you know, on pretty cool – Pretty cool opportunity where you can go on a cruise and learn, and uh, we'll talk about that later. And uh, so, welcome, Walter. Great to have you. And uh, we're we're really excited. We've been looking forward to this interview, obviously, since we started these. You're uh, number four of eight. And uh, with that being said, let's get right to it. How how did you how did you find yourself here? What what got you into seller financing? What attracted you to this space? Well, uh, I I did my first seller finance training as a primary residence, and the reason I did it is because I didn't have any money. <laughs> That's a good reason to start <laughs> seller financing. Sure. And, uh, and, and that's really how I got started was just out of desperation to buy a house. And actually, the first 17 houses I bought back starting at 81 through maybe 84 were all seller financing. And each time I did it, I thought about, well, what could I add to this contract that I'm presenting that would make it more profitable for me? And basically, when I started back then, I had $2,000, so that was my down payment. And then I had to be able to get my down payment back before I started making payments, so I had to work in a moratorium of payments. And that typically was four to six months, and that allowed me to buy the house as a rental and then fix it up. And then I started adding clauses that really uh, were not that hard to get accepted if I could explain them in a way that made sense to the seller. And many of the houses were not financeable, either because of current lending or the house just needed work. And so I'd tackle those projects, and that's basically how I got started in it, just one at a time, non-MLS sales. Uh, I work very rarely in the MLS because it's so hard to get past the realtor to the seller to explain about seller financing when you're buying. So is that enough detail or you want more? Yeah, yeah. I mean that, that definitely that definitely allows us to you understand created you got some it. of the I'm sorry I didn't hear that. Terry? Yeah, well, there's a delay on the line. I apologize for that. Um, so, Walter, so you, you created basic agreements and then found what were some of the additions you added into contracts to, to help the seller and, the, and you as the buyer out? Well, I can think about, uh, I remember wondering how much personal liability for these seller finance loans should I should I do, should I leave for a young family 
you know, at some point you say, how much debt can I be responsible for? And so that's when I moved into non-recourse financing, which I still do, I do it all the time. I, I use non-recourse when I'm buying and selling. So I'm comfortable with collateral-based loans on either side. And what I tell folks, and I really mean this, is I'm not going to ask a seller to do something I wouldn't do, or I'm not going to ask a buyer to do something I wouldn't do either. And uh, so I give non-recourse, and, and um, that's one of the clauses that I do. I, I, when I'm buying, I often want to give a discount, build in a discount in case I want to pay it off. And so that goes in right up in the front. I don't do okay. much, I don't do much uh, substitution of collateral. I never have really felt comfortable doing that in the contract uh, form, not at the not in the contract because it's so hard to know what you're going to substitute. Oh, go ahead, Wal go ahead, Walter. Okay, that I, okay substitution of collateral. That's something that I played with a while, but I found out I didn't really like it when I was buying because it put the seller in a, in, a, in a position where they had to make a decision on a collateral that they didn't know anything about. So should I just explain what that is to your audience? Yes, please do. All right, substitution of collateral allows the note to be collateralized with another property. And I, I actually, this is this is how it kind of works. Back in the '80s, in the mid '80s, you know, when the when the market was so bad nationwide in the mid '80s because of the high FHA rates, up to 18 percent, if you can imagine that, it made made uh, houses unaffordable for most people. So seller financing was, at that point, uh, a good alternative for the sellers. So I presented that and and. So uh, actually how I started using substitution of collateral, which means you can pick up the loan and put it on another house of equal or greater value. And what happened and so back that, in that – I'm sorry, go right ahead. So, I, I apologize. So, so that would help a seller out that didn't want to be paid off because of potentially capital gains or something like that. So you could move – into you know, bringing it to today – even though maybe it's not something that people understand, you could actually um, defer gains if someone wanted to be paid off when you sold the house, maybe on a new loan. You could you could bring it over to another property, and they will still keep their loan in place. Yeah, the, the terms typically would be the same, but we just moved, switched collateral. And how that first came up in my career was I had a fire. We had a fire, and insurance policy was going to pay off the loan and I called up the the you know the person I was paying the mortgagee and I said would you like to put it on another property and keep this going and they did so I used the proceeds to go buy another property and then I moved the mortgage over to that and it's funny I think I got the world's record at least what I know I moved that mortgage eight times before it's paid off <laughs> in wow. a 15 wow. year period wow and so that's where that came from now, when you when you um, uh, say non-recourse, one of the benefits of having a non-recourse not only to um, to you know just keeping it with the collateral would be those are those are required by an IRA account. Is that not? Yeah, that's correct? right. IRAs can borrow money, but it's got to be non-recourse to the IRA owner. Uh, they can't guarantee it. So um, it wouldn't be like a typical bank loan. So the, the, the IRA nor the IRA owner can guarantee the loan. So that doesn't mean they can't foreclose on it. They certainly can for non-payment. It's just that there's no guarantees or personal liability. That's basically what it amounts to. And that's, that's not a hard thing to get when you're, when you're asking for seller finance. Uh, if you couch it in the, in the context of the IRA world, it's not a hard thing to get when you're buying. And right? one, one of the cool things you talk about, Walter, is… Do you have a is, question, Mark? Yeah, one of the cool things you talk about, Walter, is, is how you, you, know, you, you basically present it that um, you know, if you are, are buying with non-recourse, you know, you're, you're, you're only offering someone something that, you know, that you would do yourself, meaning if you're, off, if you're buying as non-recourse, if you're bringing someone in, if you're selling to them, you'll offer them the same. And it, it's kind of an interesting uh, thought process because, 
you know, a lot of people in our industry kind of have that pirate's creed, you know, take what you can, give nothing back. And you actually look at it invariably as, well, if I'm, you know, if I'm not going to give you something in my right hand that I'm not already doing in my left hand. So I, I, I like that. I, I think a lot of more people should look at it and think about structuring deals that way. Well, I don't want to set anybody up for failure. So when I'm seller financing, when somebody is buying a house from me and the seller finance, which I did this afternoon at 3.30, and so had somebody come in, we, we agreed to the terms, I want to make sure that it fits their budget. Yeah. So and because I've been doing this long enough, I know that not every mortgage is going to work out. they got life events. <laughs> this we had um, this particular person's been in the house since 2009, and and so we we were structuring seller financing because she was in uh, grad school, and and so she needed some terms that fit her budget while she was not working, and so that that's what we did, and it worked out just fine. But I'm but I know that some of these houses we're going to get back just like any mortgage company is going to get some back. A certain percent. And sure. So I want to set it up so it's going to be a, a pleasant thing for the person I'm dealing with. And I know, and this is what I told them today when we set up this loan. I said, look, if we if we create this financing and it, it was a hundred payment loan, and the payments were three seventeen on this particular house uh, for a hundred payments, seven percent interest. And I said, look, if you need to sell this house. I'll work with the person who you would sell it to, get get a down payment, and I'll keep it going. So I'm just anticipating that not everything works out when you're doing seller financing on either side. And that, that brings up a, a great next question. This is a really broad general one, and you can feel free to answer it however you like. Why do you think that that people fail in this space? Well, I have found that this whole seller financing piece is not talked about much, and certainly not in the realtor circles. Um, that it's, it's not part of their training. I'm a realtor and went through the training, and it just was like a paragraph about seller financing. It wasn't a way of life. So it's not well known, and I just find that this – this may surprise you, but it takes time to read an, a Fannie Mae note and deed of trust. <laughs> and so many people don't ever read what they're, what those the terms are. When my boys, both of my boys are in the business, 133 and 130, when they came back from being that old Miss that we talked about, um, I, I said, this is what we're going to do. I put up, I got a projector and put up a Fannie Mae note and deed of trust. And I said, we're going to read every word of this. I don't care how long it takes us. <laughs> and it took us about six weeks, you know, hour at a time. <laughs> We'd blow the words up really big. <laughs> so we'd have a three-sentence paragraph that covered the whole wall. <laughs> what does this mean? What does this mean? And that was very helpful to them because they knew now what a note and deed of trust said. But I, I just find that most people don't take the time to do that hard work. It's it's not that it's difficult. It just requires discipline. That's why I think people fail. They don't understand what they're doing. Something that um, uh, that I learned just recently um, from Jim Eckley was he said that a note is basically um, like a, a checkbook or like a um, like a check in a checkbook. You know, it's got a signature, it's got the payor, the payee, and it's very simple. And um, he, he, you know, he took all the items that are in a check that you write, and, and it's under the Uniform Commercial Code, I think he said. And a note is the same thing, only it's secured by a deed of trust that's recorded usually somewhere to give notice. And mm -hmm. um, some of these things are so simple that get bypassed that that make understanding them so much more clear than they need to, you know I think we make things difficult sometimes well and your business model of, of being a consultant in some capacity I think is so needed I don't know anybody in my town who consult could consult on this it's just not, it wouldn't be a realtor it wouldn't be an attorney it wouldn't be a CPA so you, you you've got a very niche business that I'm sure is appreciated by those 
you know that need your help. Well, yeah. we 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 see so much misinformation in, in this space, and and we see so many people making it so much harder than it needs to be when we offer a, a viable, simple solution. Simple in the sense that you know you still have to do it, but viable in the sense that that it, that it can be done and you can do it with confidence. Well, I tell you another reason I think people fail to, in the in the context of seller financing is they don't ask. Yeah. And so, you know, what's wrong with just making an all terms offer? Forget about the cash offer. This is on the basis of which I would buy your house. You know, these terms. I, I recently bought an office building, um, and it was on the market for one sixty. It was a seventeen hundred square foot commercial building in on the fringe of our neighborhood, and I wanted to, since we've had such a downturn in values in Mississippi in our area, we've had a seven year decline, which is might be shocking for those that are seeing <laughs> that are having such fun in the uh, uh, appreciating markets. We haven't seen that yet, but I wanted to have a public presence when the market turned, and I think it is beginning to show that. So uh, it was on the market for 160. I made a only. A, I was only going to buy it if I could get seller financing. And so we bought it in a trust. This was from an attorney. It was an attorney's office that outgrew it. And uh, it, it, here's what we did. It was 135 was price, 25,000 down, and seller finance. That would be the attorney at three percent interest, 10 year amortization. 1,063 is a payment beginning four months after closing, and uh, and I could take title in a trust and non-recourse. There you go. That was my offer, and it got accepted, and we closed. So I mean, it's just knowing what to ask is knowing what you want is the hardest thing. Not getting it accepted. And, and guys, listen to that for for a second. Let's hit the rewind button and go back and and hear what Walter said. It was purchased from an attorney, so by, by no means, uh, you know, does the myth that you know only stupid people or only people undeserving or willing are involved in this space. You can you can structure your deal and present it to someone to the degree that you can actually explain it, of course, uh, and and get it in front of someone that's highly qualified, highly educated, and and otherwise you might be thinking they might say no. So I'm, I'm sure, Walter, you've had many experiences like that, have you not? I have, but uh, i tell you what, a, p a major piece is it. After I presented my offer, I, s I said, and this was through a realtor too, and I, and I said, let me come and sit down with the seller and explain my offer. And once I did uh, walk through it, we had a 15-minute conversation, and he said, that's fine. Let's sign, sign the contract. There wasn't any more discussion. There wasn't any more of negotiating. He just wanted to know that it was a real person behind this offer, even though it was a collateral based loan. Right. Meaning meaning it was non recourse. So he's got the right to foreclose if I don't pay. Now did he ask for any I'm sorry, say it again? I th I think Terry's uh, had some audio difficulty. Anyways, uh, Walter, so yeah, go ahead. I'll just listen. I'm I've got a bad connection. Okay. Okay. So, uh, just pulling up questions as we go. Go ahead, guys. Um, I I've got a bad connection. Huh. Okay. Well, uh, so let, let, let me just, uh, you know, I don't want to brush over the fact that sitting down, explaining your offer is a very important piece of getting seller financing accepted. Now, if you can't get through whoever the agent is or the personal representative in the case of an estate, then uh, I've done this many times, and I, and I, I suggest that it's a good way to do it. Pull, pull out your iPhone create a video of you explaining what your offer is, hold up the contract, and point out the clauses. <laughs> it you know, gets you one of those uh, selfie sticks that you can hold your camera out far enough, and, and it's really compelling. I mean, who, who makes a video offer, really? 
Have you ever heard anybody doing that? No, but it makes it more real. And one of the things you talk about in your your program, I, I you know, talk about simple, but but you know, things that things that people don't do that they should otherwise do, is the um, is how you you attach your amortization schedule. It you know, it certainly makes it a lot more real, a lot more tangible to the the person reviewing your offer. Yeah, I'm not sure anybody even looks at it. But it does make it more real. Sure. You know, it, it adds bulk to the offer. Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we're getting a bunch of questions here on Dodd-Frank, and you actually are one of the few people we've spoken to over this past, I don't know, couple of years that we've been on this mission, for lack of a better word, that, that actually understands Dodd-Frank. What? Um, let, let's, let's talk about it for a few months and uh, see, you know, what... Um, you know, let, let's let's go into it. What what have your experiences been so far? Uh, I've had no experiences with Dodd Frank in in terms of anybody objecting to what I'm proposing. So I mean, it's just you know, in terms of the realtor community, nobody knows about that. And so it's really when you're when you're when you're buying or selling, you need to educate yourself about them. And it's and you guys are so good at that. I mean, I'm not really, uh, I know you guys have studied that a lot more. I know that an individual trust or estate is exempt if they do, you know, one transaction in a in a 12-month period, and you correct me if any of this is wrong. Sure. Uh, and so I try, to, I try to deal with individuals, trust, or estates. So when I'm buying a house from an individual trust or estate, I don't mind uh, explaining why it's important for them to go ahead and sell to my end buyer because they're exempt from Dodd-Frank. So I've been able to not engage Dodd-Frank at that level several times. And of course, um, investors, it's, it's a non-issue, and cash purchases, it's a non-issue. Uh, do you disagree with anything I said? No, oh, I, I, I think, the, again, the, the, the question here that people you know, really, for whatever reason, just don't seem to be able to get their ha heads around is the, the, the there's a very simple one sim simple common denominator, and that's the question of who is the buyer. If you're buying as the investor, you, you you're you're you know you're you're exempt. You know, if the right. buyer if the buyer is an end user, an owner occupant, that's when you know that's when we're talking about. Um, you know the fact that that it is applicable, and and of course you do have some exemptions, uh, but you know again there there's the question in the left hand of compliance with federal law. Then there's the question of having a uh, a fully compliant note, and we're going to actually have an interview probably later next month, not part of this series, but um, from the with the first person we've pretty much ever met that actually appraises notes. Uh, it's really interesting, and. Mm -hmm. um, and you know one of the things uh, he obviously talks about is the value of the note is created at the moment it is created, and you know you you really can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So, um, you know I I think really it you know this stuff isn't very interesting talking about Dodd Frank, and but I you know for whatever reason it keeps coming up, and um, the the question's pretty simple, guys. Uh, the, the several people that have asked this question, you know, who is the buyer, and and if the buyer is is an owner occupant, then then yeah, you have some exemptions. Uh, they're on our website, but um, you know, it's, you're better safe than sorry because if you are not fully exempt, um, you know, there could be an attorney coming after you. So, anyways, I, I don't want to go riff on Dodd Frank forever. I, hopefully, that answered the the several questions that we had. All right, let me say something about that if I could. All right, so. It really, you as the buyer, it's not an issue. You as the investor buyer, right? Yeah. I mean, when somebody says, so it's not, it's not, so you look at a pie chart as to what, what percentage of your business on the selling side are you selling to homeowners? And I've historically done more investor loans when I'm selling than I have homeowners. So that pie chart might be two-thirds of my business would be an investor, so it's not subject to Dodd-Frank. And so you're only dealing with a third in, the, in that example of your total business, so you either got to get a mortgage loan originator 
or figure out what the exemptions are and work in that area. I don't know too many other choices that you have, but you got to if you're going to do any volume at all, you got to address it. Yeah, if you're doing over three transactions, if you're selling three over three transactions as an investor in a 12-month period, uh, you definitely need a mortgage loan originator. But the question is, even if you take the exemption, you can't attach a balloon. And that was another question that just popped up. Um, right. it, you know, it's, you cannot use a balloon, so you really don't have an exemption if you call yourself a real investor. Stick the buyer, the fee to the buyer. And, and move the move the fee onto the other side of the fence as we always do, and move it on the other side of the HUD, as as you would if it was any other type of transaction that the buyer is always typically used to be paying. And let's move on. Um, so, anyways, so hopefully that that addresses that addresses that. Something else I, I wanted to talk to you about was uh, in your program, which I recently went through. Uh, you were talking about you know this idea that that you know the that you know that your offer is is a blank piece of paper and you it, I'm actually paraphrasing you're kind of the artist uh, putting in your own putting in your own terms so can you can we go into that in terms of uh, you know I think it was in your attitude section which right was actually right. was actually was I'm sure you didn't think much of it when you're putting it together at the time, but it was it's actually pretty opening in terms of the mind and allowing you to look at this from a different angle and expand your, your thoughts moving forward. Well, I, I, I'll just say from my perspective, you know, it's important to know what needs to go in a contract and, and just as important needs to know what doesn't need to go in a contract. And so uh, I've had many occasions where I'll talk to somebody and we'll make a deal and I didn't have a contract. For whatever reason, you know, somebody flags me down by the signage on my car, and I wasn't prepared to make a deal. So, you know, pull out a napkin or piece of paper, and you got to write in on that blank piece of paper what terms. Not only would it be a binding contract, but what do you want to put in there? And there's really when you're when you're buying with seller financing, you can reduce that to a one page and explain it. But it, and you need to know what needs to go in there. You know, in each so I know that for me, non-recourse is going to be part of every seller financing offer that I make when I'm buying. Right, uh, and it and it's also going to be a trust. I'm not going to buy anything ever. Now, this is an ever statement. <laughs> I, <laughs> I get I get on my wife all the time about asking you know absolute questions and looking for absolute answers. <laughs> Are you ever going to do that? I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to buy a property outside of a trust. Period. There are just too many benefits. All right, so that goes back to why do people not use trust? Because it's hard to get the concept. Right. Plenty of education out there. Yep. But it's to, it, to, it took me 10 years before I said, well, what's the worst thing that could happen when you put it in a trust? What's the worst thing? You mess up the title so you can't convey out. Right. Well, you can always pull out a typewriter if you can find one and make a correct. A corrected deed. And the, you shouldn't be afraid of them. Is my point. Yeah. And I was just afraid of them because I didn't understand it for so long. But it's important if you're going to be a uh, if you're going to move from an amateur investor to a professional investor, you got to engage something like this. My opinion. That's just sure. my opinion. Sure. Sure. Yeah, and 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 obviously, if you're buying with a trust, you, you're you can't go to B of A and say. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, mortgage Loan Originator, I, I'm going to need to get a loan from you guys here at the bank, and and uh, it's going to be an X Y Z trust uh, as the holding company. They're going to tell you, obviously, uh, beat it, right? Well, uh, it's not impossible, but it's nearly impossible <laughs> <laughs> to get to to get financing from an institution with title and a trust. Sure, almost impossible. Sure. Well, who who turned you on to buying with trust? Obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of people on this call, and some of them might not be too familiar with it. Um, you know, just to give it some context, what we were actually talking about. Uh, uh, my mentor, uh, Jack Miller, who passed away five years ago, and um, he he was not he, he had a very loyal following because he was in the real estate business, and he would and he would create a three-day course on corporations, trusts, seller financing, 
retirement accounts, sure. management, all those things that he was using in his business. And people would come. I mean, he would have, you think about today having two or three hundred people at an event. Well, he had two or three people at his events. <laughs> and they were on taxation. And I was one of them. I, I remember for years when I was working still that I would take one of my two weeks off vacation and drive to his seminar. And so I was I wanted to know what he had to say and I did that and he taught every month <laughs> for thirty years. But he didn't really it was before the internet. He didn't really I mean he didn't really engage all that the internet marketing. He just taught good content and one of his his a do or die things was to engage the world of trust. So you can do it. I mean, every house he ever bought was in a trust. Sure. And it was all su subject to. What I like about trust is that you don't have to have permission from the state. Right. To form one, we can form one right here tonight. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. Right. Yeah. Well, moving along, what what about uh, in terms of deal structuring? Let, let's go into that. You know, I I know. Uh, one of the things you talk about is, uh, you know, basically note creation, which of course is, is what we do, and obviously something we're passionate about. Um, you talk about note creation and with respect to property acquisition and creating the first and second, selling the first, obviously keeping the second. The money that that is created in terms of originating and selling the first essentially was the money that that helped uh, form the deal. So. Let's let's go into that for a few minutes. Well, our, our price points are different than a lot of areas <laughs> around the country, so this may not make any sense to you California folks <laughs> at all. We've just got cheap housing. Right. And it's gotten a lot cheaper over the over the last seven years. Uh, let me tell you, here, here's a point. I agreed to buy a house <laughs> that had a, a 650 tenant, 650 a month tenant that I'm paying $9,500 for, central air and heat, today. I, I agreed to buy a three-bedroom, one-bath central air and heat house today for $7,500, another one. So I, nobody can uh, relate to those numbers. Um, we sold one this week to an owner occupant of three-bedroom, two-bath for uh, for forty-nine with $3,000 down. So they're move, moving in this weekend. So I mean, so the what used to what used to sell for eighty, the value now is fifty at the most, and then what has happened to drive those prices down is none of the lenders, institutional lenders, are making fixer loans here. I don't know any bank that'll do that. Yeah, that's that's a big problem. In in Terry calls them the flyover states. There, that's uh, they've definitely retreated from that market for sure. So, so it allows me to, when I'm buying, I can create a note. So I always go in. Look, I can pay you this cash, or I can, and let's just pick a number. Uh, I can pay you twenty-two thousand with two down, and create a five-year note when I'm buying. Or I can pay you eighteen. Which would you rather have? Well, most people take the eighteen. Really, I mean that's just how it works. And then I turn around and sell that house subject to whatever financing I've created to a homeowner, Dodd-Frank compliant. And so I structure the payments. Now get this, all right, so it would be a $700 rental. I try to make the payments, P&I payments, around 400 So we've got taxes and insurance to add to that, but that's what I do. So we, we, create, we create two notes or a 60-month or note and then wrap it. I like to do that too and then just sell off the 60-month note if I – if the seller that I'm buying from didn't create the financing. Sure. Sure. Fantastic. And and where are you 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 know, and obviously this 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 next question leads into the one after that. Where are you finding your you know, because you typically you're selling to IRA investors, where do you find your IRA investors? Most of the IRA investors are people that I know that I've, I've met through teaching about IRAs. And, um, you know, right now, today, the stock market's going crazy, but that won't always be that way. Sure. I mean, and so uh, a lot of people are afraid of the stock market right now, and they would like to put 
Well, I had, uh, let's see, when, last Friday, I had a, a doctor come to town. He lived 90 miles away, and I met him to, at an event. He said, I want to come and put some IRA money with you. I said, well, come get in the car. Let me show you what I'm doing. And so I tell him, All right, here's something. We can do, a, a, if you want to buy some property with me, I like doing that. Uh, and that would be a two-thirds or one-third model where they put up, uh, let, let's, I'll just pick some numbers. Sure. It may be worth 60 and uh, so I, I discount the value by 25%. So uh, we, got a, we got an appraisal of 60 and let's just say it's a 750 rental, three-bedroom, two-bath house. We'll create a strike price between us of 45, which is a 25% off appraisal. And I said, would you like to buy two-thirds of this house for 30000 bucks?" And we'll just split the income, split split the expenses, and that's a, that's a good way of hedging for what might happen is, you know, hyperinflation. Sure. Combining that with I can create and sell off one of these first 60-month payments, uh, let's just say it's an 8% face value note for 60 payments, I can, you know, knock a couple of thousand dollars off as a discount and create a good yield, much much more than an 8% yield, and that's attractive too. Usually people want to do both. Both, not one or the other. Sure. Because they, you know, if if we have hyperinflation, they won't have that note out there for long periods of time. I don't know whether we're going to have it or not, but it's just a hedge against your bets. Sure, sure. So let's let's talk about IRA investing. You you do a IRA Fun Cruise, and I think the website is irafuncruise.com. dot com. Yeah. Is that right? uh, Quincy, Quincy Long with Quest Iron IRA out of Houston. Quest IRA. Uh, we're buddies, and we and uh, we enjoy being around each other, even though we're frickin' frack, heckle and jekyll. I'm totally opposite of him. <laughs> can you and can you give me the the link, Walter, for the chat box? I I already put the Dodd Frank notes for all the Dodd Frank questions that we got, uh, and you can find that in the chat box. We give away a, a free disclosure for you guys, uh, but I wanted to put your IRA website. Uh, is yeah, it? Is it's uh, irafuncruise.com. Fun cruise. Okay, guys, you can and find that in the uh, chat box, and you can. I think you can just link right to it, and the Dodd Frank notes is uh, down there as well, where you can get your free disclosure. Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, we have a hundred, hundred and thirty people come, and this is our fourth one that we've done. So it's not a. The purpose is not a money making cruise for Quincy Long or myself. We charge a hundred dollars above the cost of the cruise to go. So. What we're interested in is building relationship, networking, uh, and giving good content. But what happens is so many people uh, have, a, have a chance to sit down and have a drink with somebody and explain what they're trying to accomplish. Many deals come out of that, and it's, yeah. it's a, and we we and we use a format that that I really like. It's a TED Talks format. So we got I got my buddies from around the country to come, and they pay their own way. And uh, so they present 20 minutes on a single thought. So they're not going to tell their life story. They're going to talk about how they use trusts or how sure. they use personal property trusts. And so we run three of them back-to-back, 20-minute -back, presentations, and then the three speakers go to the three corners of the room for Q&A. We have a break and do that again. And we did one in May of this year. It was an eight-night cruise that we had 40 20-minute presentations, different topics. <laughs> How about that? That's a bunch. That's sure. a whole bunch. Sure. And so uh, it's not a vacation. Don't think this is a. This is not a vacation. <laughs> it just happens to be a seminar at sea. Sure. So anybody is it, you can still come. Somebody signed up today for it, and um, just go to the site. You'll see how to register. It's cheap. This this. I mean, we're going out of New Orleans on January the 11th, and seven nights going down to Cosmel, Roatan. And Belize, and we'll we'll end up having about thirty presentations. But it's how much how much time we have at sea is why we do. Uh, sure. Why we pick them. Sure, sure. Uh, all right. Well, in wrapping it up, uh, as I mentioned to you guys, we we occasionally when when we see something that that's great, uh, we do do a little bit of affiliate marketing. We're not. Uh, you know, horrors of affiliate marketing. We don't 
we don't just uh, sell anyone's product. We don't. We really only endorse the stuff we use ourselves. There's uh, you can actually get two of the links down below of of two products that we endorse. Um, Walter actually has done uh, presentations with them, and certainly we've done presentations on their show, and they've come on ours. And you can get those below uh, free uh, software at free uh, deal software at yourprivatemortgage.com and uh, sellerfinancehelp.com. Uh, where you can get uh, basically deal sourcing, which is obviously important. Uh, those are free resources. Uh, the link that you, we set up with Walter, and this is basically our third, and uh, we, we might may or may not take on something else, but we, we really limit what we do in terms of affiliate marketing, is sellerfinancepartners.com. You can see the, uh, I'll put it in the chat box as well, so you can link to it if you like. And um, this is Walter's most recent program. He did something really cool. He created a pre-launch prod, uh, product that allowed uh, him to highly discount the product, in fact, cut it in half. And I, I've gone through it myself. Terry's going through it uh, this week or next. Uh, he started it at least. You know, it's important to use what we're, uh, what we're showing you guys. And... Um, Someone is saying the link does not work. Well, I tested it earlier. Um, we'll email it out to you guys. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, it's a typo. <laughs> Seller Oops. Finance. Yeah, I, I can assure you the link does work. Sellerfinancepartners.com. And you can go to it and uh, basically... Uh, Basically, it's his sell profitable seller financing product. It's an awesome product. It'll really give you the nuts and bolts. Uh, he practically is giving it away at uh, I think it's two ninety seven. Anyways, can you t uh, talk a little bit about that before we sign off tonight, Walter? Sure. Thank you. Um, this course I, I created uh, because I like uh, I like content creation because I, I'll do a case study. And I find it interesting. It amuses me to reduce my deals to writing, <laughs> and then I get to tell about them. So uh, I recorded uh, the basic course about three years ago, and I said, "No, wait a minute. Everything has changed the way I do business, the way that Dodd Frank impacts everything." So I said, "I'm I'm scrapping that. I'm going to do it again." And and I just finished it about two weeks ago, and we were. Um, and it's eight, 18 videos. It's about 10 hours of stuff, but it's not just me talking. I've got some real pros that helped me put this together. So we, I had a, a live presentation for a day, and then it's all sorts of different things. So I'll give, just give you an example. Maybe you've never experienced this, but how do judgments affect your ability to buy and sell? I mean, whoever talks about that, really? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just one of the uh, topics that we talk about that you need to be tuned in to how they impact you. So uh, we we go. I t talk about my two note model that I use in detail. It's got all sorts of examples in there in case studies, um, and it's uh, again it's about six people collaborating to put together uh, some good experience. So uh, the one thing that I, I do spend time every single day with people call me and ask me to help them structure their their financing I, you know make suggestions that I'm not an attorney I'm just say well have you thought about this thought about that and people say that's very valuable and so part of this if you want to call me I mean if you if you buy the course uh, I would want you to listen to it and then try it and call me if I can help you um, I, I get probably five IRA calls a day and about two seller financing calls a day. But the reason I take the call is because I learned something for the people that are doing it. So that's part of it. I, I can help you through your next deal. Yeah, and, and, and I think th that brings up two points. We've had some questions here. How do you get a hold of Walter? Uh, I gave out the the IRA fund crews. Go go there. I think you have a video on it too. It's yeah, been a while yeah. since, so uh, you can get some free, more free content. Um, but you also in the he's throwing in access to with this this pre launch. He's throwing in access to his own private coaching for twelve uh, twelve months. 
It's an absolute bargain if you consider the price. Um, and then he's actually giving you an hour consultation. So several of you asked how do you get a hold of him. Uh, buying his product would be a, a, a great start. That's a good start, isn't it? Well, uh, let's talk about that uh, 12 months. What I'm going to do, and I've already got, I've already got this slated. We'll do it once a month. But uh, I have been very fortunate to be involved with some real doers uh, in in the real estate arena and the note arena, and a lot of a lot of friends that uh, we will we will have an interview about how they're using seller financing in their market. And so there'll be twelve different topics, and it'll be my first one's going to be from a guy up in Columbus, Ohio, who's using them all the time, uh, seller finance. So it's different markets exposing about seller financing. I just find that's that's a way to learn is having people tell you what they did. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So that's the coaching content. Is we'll we'll have twelve webinars, and of course I'm available to help if you need some help. Yeah, which is huge. The, the, the value here is ridiculous. Uh, go to sellerfinancepartners.com. Get his, get his product. And, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not writing offers after you, after you watch his product, some, you know, it's, something's wrong. And, uh, you know, maybe you're in the wrong space. I doubt it if you're on this call, certainly at 9 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> But uh, right. yeah, so in, in wrapping things up, Walter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, for being on the call. Thank you for being a, a really gracious uh, leader in our industry. And uh, you know, you, you, you'd like to see that out of more people uh, like you. So from the bottom of our hearts, we, we uh, are uh, appreciative and, and thank you. And uh, I know Terry would be saying the same thing if his uh, connection wasn't lost. And uh, we'll email you guys out the links. Uh, several of you asked for replays. You can subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel at Seller Finance Consultants. And this whole interview series, it, we basically did it as a prelude to 2014. And with our thoughts that 2015 is going to be the, the big, big, uh, you know, first year of seller financing, we, we wanted to give you a head start and an edge on, you know, with education. You can watch uh, these. We, we usually get them up a day or two after the, uh, the interview, and we'll have uh, four more good ones. Uh, next week will be uh, something that you guys have never, ever heard. I can guarantee you of that. So you'll want to look out for that. And uh, with that being said, have a great Thanksgiving, Walter. Uh, go uh, Ole Miss, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. Absolutely. Good night, guys.